Hey, my name is Harrison Williams. I'm going to talk today about energy harvesting, intermittent computing, and some of the limitations of our current techniques and how we can do a lot better. This project is a collaboration between me and Steve Jan and Matthew Higgs, who are both professors at Virginia Tech. So as a general historical trend, processors are shrinking. First computers took up an entire room, but microcontrollers today can be a couple millimeters on a side. As these devices are getting smaller and cheaper, they're also consuming less power. This opens the door for a lot of new applications in different fields, things like wirelessly powered devices, smart tags and smart dust, and computational medical implants. But why don't we see more of these devices today? The big reason is batteries. So here's a typical coin battery you might find powering one of these systems. It's about 20 millimeters across. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but you could fit 13 fully featured microcontrollers in the same space. Then you have to worry about things like weight and cost. Batteries have other problems too. What if my system is in some extreme environment like space or deep underwater? It can be expensive or even impossible to replace a battery that's gone bad. If I have a battery powering a medical implant, I've got health risks too because these batteries tend to explode if they're punctured or overheated. So the research response has been to move away from batteries entirely and get energy from the environment. There's always ambient energy around me that would otherwise go unused. My system is underwater, I can harvest the wave energy around me. If it's outside, I can attach a solar panel, things like that. So this avoids a lot of the problems that come with batteries, but energy harvesting has its own set of problems. So batteries let us make a lot of assumptions about the power available to us. We have a strong, consistent source of power in the system. But energy harvesting, on the other hand, is unreliable. The power I get depends on a lot of variables. The environment, the characteristics of the harvester, even things like device orientation can have a big impact on how much power I get end up with this unreliable, inconsistent power source. And even in the best case, energy harvesters don't output enough power to continuously supply even the lowest power microcontrollers. So I end up with this idea of intermittent power. This diagram on the top right is a high level abstraction of a typical energy harvester. The harvester gathers power from the environment and slowly feeds it into the storage capacitor, which is attached to the supply voltage rail of the microcontroller. And this plot on the bottom, the green line is the voltage on that capacitor. Eventually, it reaches some trigger point and the microcontroller turns on. It rapidly drains the supply capacitor until it reaches some brownout voltage and then it stops. Eventually, the capacitor recharges and the cycle repeats itself. So I end up with these short bursts of computation, which is what's there highlighted in blue, punctuated by common case failure. This common case failure causes some problems for us, namely that first, I'm operating under a very strict time limit. I also have an energy limit because all I've got is the charge on that capacitor. And I need to be careful about the way I try to handle these constant failures because I can run into correctness issues because I'm constantly re-executing some pieces of the code. So what can we do? If we want to plot progress versus time, the problem is that I end up doing a little work and then I lose power and I have to restart over and over and over again. I never get anything done. We want progress to look a little more like this. But the problem is, whenever I lose power, I can't trust the data in my volatile memory. That's where all my intermediate progress is. So the solution so far has been to write this intermediate progress to non-volatile memory in the form of a checkpoint, then restore it whenever I eventually get more power back. The first system that did that was Mementos back in 2011. Now there's a big body of follow-on work about efficiently and minimally writing checkpoints to persistent memory. But the problem with these non-volatile checkpoints is that your performance is limited by the characteristics of the memory. So let's look at our options. So first we've got flash. The most common memory available, it's in 99% of microcontrollers you'll see today. Reading from flash is really fast, so it's great for code storage. The problem is writing to flash is really slow, really energy intensive. In a flash-based checkpointing scheme, you can easily end up spending more time writing checkpoints than doing actual useful work. But the big thing that kills flash is that it's got low endurance. You can only write to a flash cell between 10 and 100,000 times before the cell is worn out and you can't use it anymore. Now normally this is fine, but these systems typically take at least 10 checkpoints a second. You'd end up wearing out the flash in about a day and then the whole device is useless because you can't take checkpoints anymore. So newer systems have moved on to these emerging non-volatile memories. And the biggest one is FRAM, it's ferroelectric RAM. FRAM is great because writing to it is fast and it's really low energy. FRAM doesn't have the endurance problems that flash has. So checkpoints to FRAM are really fast. Downside is, though, that reading from FRAM isn't quite as fast as reading from Flash. So in the sort of common case, when you're just trying to execute useful code, you can end up with lower overall performance. But the biggest problem with these FRAM-based chips is just that they're uncommon. Most vendors don't even manufacture them. And those that do, their FRAM devices are typically a narrow slice of their overall microcontroller portfolio. 
So you're limited by the platforms. You might find yourself needing a microcontroller that has a specific feature for some reason or another, but if it doesn't have FRAM, you're out of luck. So let's look at the last memory on these systems, SRAM. It's the main memory on pretty much every microcontroller because it's the highest performance technology available. You can do anything a lot faster in SRAM than you can with flash or FRAM. And again, it's ubiquitous. You're gonna find it on pretty much every device. So it'd be great if we could keep our checkpoints in here because we wouldn't have the performance limitations of flash or the availability limitations of FRAM. If we did that, there wouldn't be any transfer overhead because our volatile state is already in the SRAM, so we don't have to move it anywhere. The only problem, of course, is that it's volatile, so when I restart the system, I can't actually trust that it's held onto its data. This takes us to our first observation, which is that SRAM has time-dependent volatility. So this plot here on the right is from experiments on our evaluation hardware, and what we're plotting is the perfect retention time, and so that's the longest time that I can turn the system off, and then when I turn it back on, see that I've lost no data in my SRAM. So this varies primarily with two things. So it varies with temperature, so we sweep from 20 degrees Celsius, which is about room temperature, up to 85 degrees C, which is the max operating temperature for our devices. We also look at a 10 microfarad supply capacitor because that's the total capacitance attached to the power rail on our evaluation boards, and 47 microfarads because that's the size of the supply capacitor on currently deployed energy harvesting systems today. We can see that even with a 10 microfarad capacitor, at room temperature, you can have full data retention for over five minutes. And it's also worth noting that this isn't a new effect. So past work has explored this in the context of timekeeping on batteryless devices. And they found that even with no added capacitor, you can get about two seconds of data retention in the SRAM based entirely on the capacitance in the SRAM and intrinsic to the microcontroller itself. Our second observation is that intermittent off times are short. So here's the same graph as before, but we're zoomed in to about a minute. These horizontal lines are the max off times we can expect in a single burst of computation based on a couple of different power sources. We've got thermal energy harvesting, EM, and at the bottom, motion-based energy harvesting. So looking at this graph, if the retention time curve is above the horizontal line, then that means that for those conditions, we can expect SRAM to hold on to data for long enough that even the longest off times for that power source won't corrupt our data. So let's say that we're operating at 25 degrees C and we need to hold on to our data when we're running off one of these power sources. I can pay the price to write to flash and that would reliably store my data for about 100 years. Or I could keep my data in SRAM and get about five to six minutes of retention, which is a lot closer to what I actually need. So SRAM data retention fits the problem a lot better. Why write to this expensive non-volatile memory at all? And of course the problem is because some off times are long enough that I'm definitely gonna lose data in my SRAM. The typical example is solar panels at night. But it's true for most devices. They're all gonna experience long times at some point without power. And we make a couple of observations about these off times too. So first, a lot of power failures are like the solar panel example where the longer off times are infrequent and predictable. So in those cases, if you need to preserve data across long power cycles, it's fine to pay the one-time cost for a non-volatile checkpoint. And in other cases, we can say that long off times are basically irrelevant. What I mean by that is long off times separate two distinct, unrelated bursts of computation. My transient data from a single transaction on a smart card isn't likely to be related to another transaction I make, say, eight hours later. More likely, it'll just get thrown out. So in general, the longer off times that these devices experience don't actually need full data retention, and of the ones that do, a lot of them are predictable and easy to handle. And so with all that in mind, we design a system called Total Recall that enables intermittent computation using SRAM data remnants instead of writing persistent memory. Total Recall is efficient because it avoids all interaction with the slower memory by using SRAM to take advantage of these common case short off times. And it's correct because it knows how to handle uncommon case long off times that actually do corrupt the SRAM. So let's look at what a checkpoint looks like in Total Recall. On the right is a diagram of the on-chip SRAM. Normally this is filled entirely with program data, but we reserve a small space, about 40 bytes, for our checkpoint data. That contains CPU registers, peripheral registers, any other volatile state that you want to save that isn't captured in the regular program data. On top is the checksum, which is the output of a cyclic redundancy check over the rest of the memory. We choose CRCs because they're simple, they're easy to implement in software. 
they're fast, and we'll see in the evaluation that calculating a CRC, even in software, can be orders of magnitude faster than writing to non-volatile memory. And finally, there's often hardware support for them. A lot of these energy harvesting devices send data wirelessly, so they need to include checksums along with that data anyway. That means that designers typically choose platforms that include CRC hardware accelerators that we can reuse for our checkpoints. So let's look at exactly how it works. We're gonna plot supply voltage over time. So the energy harvester will slowly charge the supply capacitor until it reaches our trigger point and the microcontroller turns on and it drains all that energy pretty quickly. But right before we lose power, we're gonna call the checkpoint routine. So it's a, attached typically to say a voltage supervisor interrupt. So we write all of our CPU and peripheral registers to the reserve space in SRAM and then calculate our CRC over the registers and program data. And we also store that checksum in SRAM. Then we just wait. And eventually, as the microcontroller isn't running, the supply voltage will slowly drop. And in the common case, it's gonna stay high enough that we actually don't lose any data in SRAM. Then eventually, the energy harvester is gonna find more energy and it's gonna charge the capacitor up again to the trigger point and we're gonna restart. The first thing we do is we recalculate the CRC. We check it against what we have saved in SRAM. In the common case, the CRCs will match and we'll know that our data is intact. We'll reinitialize the device and restore our registers, ending with the program counter, and we pick up right where we left off. If we are off long enough for SRAM to lose data, the CRCs won't match, and we can detect that data corruption. In that case, we can just restart from scratch or from a non-volatile checkpoint if we have one. So how do we evaluate it? We had two evaluation platforms, both MSP430s, which is about the class of device you'd expect to see in a system like this. One's a flash-based device, and the other one's an FRAM-based device that also had a CRC accelerator on it. This picture on the right, the red board is the evaluation board for the flash-based chip. The green board on top is a custom daughter board that we use to get fine-grained control over the voltage supply to the chip under test. For benchmarks, we used typical programs that you would find on systems like this, signal processing, math, sorting. For the baseline systems, we implemented checkpoints to non-volatile memory that are triggered in the same way as total recall. So they write a checkpoint to non-volatile memory when they detect that they're about to lose power. So for these plots, we're gonna look at total runtime overhead. We assume that if the system's on, we're either doing useful work or spending that time to write a checkpoint. On these plots, we vary supply capacitor size and clock frequency. So clock frequency is important because there's often a slightly sublinear relationship between clock frequency and power consumption. So that means that running at 16 megahertz might only be 15 times more expensive than running at one megahertz. So ultimately you get more done. We're also plotting two bars for flash. Because of the way flash is built, you have to erase a cell before you write to it. And these both take a lot of time. The blue bar is overhead when you erase on every checkpoint, and the orange bar is overhead, assuming that you actually never have to erase a flash checkpoint, so you're only ever writing. There are ways to avoid having to erase every single time you write when you write a checkpoint, so an optimal flash system will probably be somewhere in between. We're also plotting here in green the overhead numbers for one of our total recall implementations, and you can see that in pretty much every configuration, the flash overhead is orders of magnitude higher than the overhead that total recall imposes. So let's look at the overhead you can get with this high performance sort of state of the art memory and compare that to total recall. The blue bar is for FRAM and we can see that it's between 10 and 20% overhead on the 10 microfarad platform and two and 4% on the 47 microfarad platform. The next two bars are for total recall with software implementations of a 16 and 32 bit CRC respectively. And those are both pretty on par with FRAM based systems. And the only qualitative difference is that total recall is applicable to any platform. The red bar on the bottom is for total recall using the CRC hardware accelerator. And you can see that it pretty cleanly beats FRAM across the board. The 47 microfarad capacitor, you can get below 1% overhead numbers on any platform as long as it has the CRC engine. So to get an idea of the practical impact on running a program, we look at how long it takes to complete our signal processing benchmark under intermittent power on the flash board. So we're plotting normalized power cycles to completion. So that's the number of power cycles the system takes to complete the benchmark, including checkpoint overhead, normalized to the number of power cycles it would take if there was no checkpointing overhead. And we could spend 100% of our on time doing actual useful work. We see in about half the configurations, there's a red X for flash, which indicates that it actually takes more time to write the flash checkpoint than is available in a single power cycle, so it'll never actually make any progress. In the couple of configurations where flash does work, it increases the total time and power consumed by between three and seven times. 
Total Recall keeps that time and power consumption close to the ideal number on the same platform with a simple software update. So we've gone over a couple of the problems with approaching program checkpoints using non-volatile memory and how we can solve these problems using just SRAM. So here's Total Recall. Instead of paying the unnecessary price to write to this persistent storage, let's exploit SRAM data remnants to preserve data across short power cycles. We can protect against corruption from long power cycles with a quick integrity check and a simple fallback strategy. In terms of checkpointing overhead, it turns out that Total Recall is on par with current high-performance non-volatile memories and can even outperform them with common hardware accelerators. And the result is efficient, high-speed intermittent computing on any platform. All of our code is available at the GitHub link here, so please take a look at it, fork it, port it to your own systems. Thanks for watching.